This is PodKit, episode 55, Rapid Unscheduled Disassembly, on Sunday, February 9th, 2020. And now, it's the Motorcycle Guy. This episode of PodKit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk55. Welcome to 2020. Oh man, hindsight's 2020. It sure is. 2020 is hindsight. You know, I haven't heard one of those 2020 jokes in a while. Good, good to have the refresher. Yeah, I yeah, haven't heard know? any of them in about two months. It's amazing how uh, that joke <laughs> was really, really in uh, in style, and now it's gone. That's that's what I'm here for to bring all of the terrible jokes back where they belong. Someone's got to do it. Someone's got to. Well, so well, how how were your uh, how were your New Year's? Everybody feeling good after all of that time? Yeah, I, uh, my January was is is gone all of a sudden. I I know most people were complaining about how long of a January it is, and in the Twin Cities, I think we had like twelve continuous days of no sun, something like that, like a record. But um, yeah, I was incredibly busy in january so i basically didn't experience much of it and then suddenly it's february and now it's nine days into february this year is flying by and now the sun is setting later time man it moves time is a flat circle how are your new year's i don't know it's uh felt like it lasted forever like you said probably on account of that uh moved moved offices um I guess I I started the new year with some work travel and ended the ended the month with lots of work. So, you know, it's good good stuff. Good to be busy. How about you, Ryan? Yeah, kind of the same actually. I uh, had kind of a quiet December, and then I had a nice you know Christmas and New Year break, and then work started again. And I I did a lot of work in January somehow, and like you, I also did some work travel. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now we're back. We're in the groove. Got to get through the rest of the winter together. Right. And so now we have to we have to actually talk about what you actually did, Brian, because you actually did the cool stuff. The rest of us yeah. just worked. That's cool, though, isn't it? I don't know. It's pretty average, pretty normal. <laughs> I suppose. Yeah, so um, the first half of January, I was working as a lighting designer for Young Artists Initiative, a theater company based out of St. Paul. Um friend of the show and fellow network podcaster Ian Buck was doing sound design. I did light design. Um, and so we did lots of theater work for Frozen Junior. It was a good show, a very long week. I pulled some crazy hours, but uh, got it got done. Super fun to do lighting again. It had, it had been almost two years. Um, you know, it when you when you finish a show and then you're like, oh, that was, that was so much fun. I'm like, should I pivot my whole career and switch? But then, you know... A couple weeks go by, and I'm like, no, I'm I'm okay with this normal life too. Yeah. So it'll it'll be a you know a an in and out kind of hobby thing that I do periodically. But nice. I love it. Um, let's see. That show closed on a Sunday, and then the following Friday, I flew out to Vietnam and went on a a, a fun like winter vacation for just the. I don't know, January time uh, with yeah. a couple of coworkers and some friends of a coworker, but just a, a fun trip. So never been to Asia. Now I've been to Vietnam. We were there for 12 days, started in the south in Ho Chi Minh City, then went north to Da Nang and then uh, into Hanoi for five nights there. Um, we were there for Tet, the Lunar New Year. So that was kind of fun to see. The city kind of closed down a bit, um, was a lot more quiet. People closed their shops for, I think... A lot of it was four days or so as the holiday. So you could kind of see the city then come alive again by the time we left, you know, just in time for us to leave. But um, yeah, it was super fun. Delicious, delicious food. Um, yeah, I'd definitely go back. It's a nice place. That's really cool. Seriously. So how did you pick Vietnam to go to? My two coworkers have some uh, Vietnamese um, family or their families from there. So um, one of them bought a plane ticket this summer and then came to work and was like, Hey, anyone want to go to Vietnam with me? And my other coworker was like, yeah. And then I'm like, yeah. And then, you know, <laughs> we bought our tickets the next day and 
yeah, then here we are. We had, we all went to Vietnam. So it was a pretty uh, casual group. So everyone kind of trickled into the country over the course of a few days. Then we had the center part of the trip. Where we were all together. And then um, a few people left after like one week. And then a few, me and my other coworker left midway through the next week. Um, a few others stayed till the next weekend. So it's kind of a trickle in, trickle out. So it's pretty, pretty casual and loose that way, which is nice. Uh, Brian, also during his travels, shared a picture with us. And we all liked it a lot. And we also were going to frame it and put it up on a wall. And <laughs> Brian thinks we're all freaks. <laughs> it, it, it is, it, it's a nice photo, yes. But here, I'll, I'll put it in the show notes for people to, to look at and know what we're talking about. Uh, but see, the, the one in the show notes will have the watermark on it. You have to go to Brian to get the license to get it printed for real. Aha, that makes sense. Copy link. It's the one of the train, the train street or alley, right? Yep, that one. Well, there's an Instagram link in the show notes. Oh, it's a Facebook product. Oh no. Our CMS hardly supports uploading actual images. It's that is you got to link it all. True. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was uh, that's a good vacation. Uh, I'm sure it was probably pretty warm. Uh, it was uh, pretty cold here in the meantime. Yeah, in, in the south in Ho Chi Minh City, which is somewhere around the 10 degree parallel, so very far south, um, it was highs in the mid 90s and lows wow. lows in the low 70s. So we we would get outside at like 6:30 in the morning trying to fight jet lag, and it would be 72, and it would feel so cool because you know the previous high of the day was in the 90s, uh, which was rather warm. I prefer cooler, but when you're only there for three days, you kind of just power through and yeah you you deal with it um da nang was cooler but still pretty hot in the 80s um and then hanoi was much cooler it was in the mid 50s to one or two days got to the upper 60s so that was more like long sleeves but it was super overcast and it poured for a couple of days as well but yes we experienced all kinds of weather it's always hard to know what to prepare for when you go on a trip like that seriously yeah, I felt a little ridiculous because when I left to go to the airport, it was probably like five degrees or something or zero going to the airport. So I had I had like all my layers on. I had big gloves and a down jacket and then shove it in my bag. And then, you know, within the 24 hours, it's 95 degrees. Mm-hmm. Jeez. But yeah, I, I traveled with like a 45 liter backpack, which was nice. So I didn't have any checked bags. I definitely recommend the pack a little lighter. Um, yeah. If you buy a lot of like nylon clothing and things, it's easy to wash and takes up much less space in your bag. Well, it's also easier when you're going to a place that's warm. Exactly. It's a uh, less grimy feeling, that's for sure. Totally. So yeah, that was Travel Kit. Travel Kit. Well, next time next time we do one of these, hopefully I will have some travel. It's probably not super likely, but I'm going to try. So hold me to it, Travel Kit. We'll do this. Need to go somewhere that's not for work. Someday. Someday. I, I'm the same, but also someday. Oh, but Brandon, someday. you and I are supposed to go to London, remember? Oh, yeah. We have to go to London for, uh, you know. Something. Uh, I don't remember something. what. Something about Dan. Yeah. I don't know. There was a bit. Oh, yeah. We're going to go say hi to Dan. That's right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Did you hear that uh, this morning or last night, the fastest subsonic travel from uh, JFK to Heathrow was made? I think like four hours and 56 minutes or something. Yeah, they had to outrun huh. the storm. Such a fast jet stream, and uh, yeah, that sounds like fun. I'd what, love to what, be on one of those. What did they say? Eight hundred miles per hour? But yeah, yeah, something something around there. That's ridiculous. What is it, the speed of sound? I don't know. Seven hundred. I'm told that birds go flying at the speed of sound to that show you how it all began. Definitely not true. <laughs> yeah, Coldplay. Anybody? Uh, no, no? I right. I got your reference. I got your warm, reference. Warm stop. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, uh, worth a shot. Speed of sound is 343 meters per second, but that is totally useless to me. Uh, yeah, multiply them both times 60. And no. Oh. Okay. Wow. Yeah, I would imagine a standard uh, jet going that fast is not good for it. I know also the 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 airflow over parts of the wings and things are are different. Um, you know, the tips might experience more stress than other parts. So, uh oh, I would imagine that part of that went supersonic, but I don't know. Don't quote me. I'm just a, a programmer. I don't know things about air phys- air and physics and 
planes and stuff. That's more Brandon's wheelhouse. <laughs> I, I'm I'm at most a uh, enthusiast. Uh, so I all I would say is, man, it'd be kind of funny to be like a Boeing engineer and be like, wait, what? You're doing what? Why is this what? <laughs> we never we never tested in this environment. They cut our budget. And now we only tested at at most 400 miles an hour ground speed. So yeah, I don't know. I just know whenever I fly, you always ask about which plane I'm in. And so now I start yeah. trying to remember to tweet which plane I'm in when I talk about flying. Yeah, yeah. You you flew on, what was it, an A330? Um, an A3, A350. A350. And A321. Yeah, yeah. So good. Love those. High quality planes the lot. And I think some Boeing 777s. Yeah, the 777s are... I You know, I don't know if I've ever been on a 777. I, it's, it's always been a goal because like... The first time I ever went to an airport, that was like a big deal, like the triple sevens. So I was like, "Oh man, they seem pretty similar to an A three fifty, but a little bit older." At least yeah, the ones I were on, or I yeah. was on. Yeah, I think you can. I think you can find seven four sevens that are newer, and the triple sevens are harder to harder to track down because I don't know. I don't think I've been on a four engine plane in maybe fifteen to twenty years. <laughs> I don't. I don't really remember if I have at this point, but I think I have at one like. Once or twice. I must have. They don't usually make those anymore. Usually they're like, well, we'll just use two giant engines rather than four smaller ones. Cause... Well, that was all about regulation, too. Because when you there used to be laws about if you're flying really long distances, you need four engines for redundancy in case there are problems Yeah. Um, to get to the nearest <laughs> airport. But then they said, eh, you're fine with three, which is why there are a few weird three-engine planes. Yeah. But that didn't last long, and now they're fine with two-engine planes. Yeah, because it turns out once you lose an engine, you're kind of screwed anyway. Yeah. So Yeah, it turns out you're going <laughs> to land immediately. Yeah, there's not really any. And if you're over the ocean, sucks to suck. Good good luck. <laughs> What's the SpaceX term? Emergency? Un- unexpected. R- rapid uh, reentry or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, there's some term. That, uh wasn't that that's what they said when the center core of the Falcon Heavy hit the ocean at 300 miles an hour, right? Something like yeah. that. Yeah, they they had a funny term for it for sure. Ah, it's called rapid unscheduled disassembly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Same me IRL. Uh, my coffee just experienced rapid unscheduled disassembly this morning before we started recording. Ooh. It was a bummer. But fortunately nothing else did, only my ego. Dignity, my dignity. That's the phrase. My dignity also. Good to hear nothing broke. Yeah, I was at first I was like, huh, is there anything electrical near this? And surprisingly, given the amount of electrical things in this office, uh no no, no computers were harmed. So there you go. That's it that's neat. Amazing. Uh I, I would normally say tune into the fringe to listen to more about that, but for some reason we strategically recorded nothing about this incident. Yeah, somehow. <laughs> I guess you just wanted to hear hear about it now. Well, yeah. you know. That's what happens when you give. There's like a there's like a graph among uh, of like how much coffee I consume, and at what point I just start throwing things with no <laughs> like, uh, you know what what happened? I threw a pen that I was writing, and I like I wasn't, you know, I wasn't trying. I just tried to write with it, and it just flew across the room. And the same thing happened with my coffee <laughs> a few minutes ago. Oh well. There you go. That's the that's the incident report right there. Rapid unscheduled disassembly of some really good cold brew. Uh, bummer. bummer. Well, speaking of uh, rapid unscheduled things, uh, let's talk about yarn two. Ryan, Ooh. you want to take the that wheel? That was a good segue. That, that was, was very good. good. Well, let's do that. Uh, so who before we talk about yarn two, who knew that yarn two was even being worked on? Does anybody even remember that? Not at all. No, I I. Almost haven't used yarn, just a little bit. So I'm really outside of that whole community. Yeah, it's really weird because the the development team posted their 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 you know release blog post, and they made it seem like everybody knew this thing was really going on. So all of this uh, started coming around about uh, I don't know two weeks ago, late January, and. It kind of, uh, you know, Yarn 2 is supposed to be this next generation version of Yarn, supposed to fix a bunch of stuff. You know, some some things that I think they took for granted or sort of admitted here. So, for example, apparently the Yarn 1 
uh, binary, the Yarn One code base is a spaghetti code monster soup. Same. And frankly, same. <laughs> because of that, apparently nobody was working on it anymore, and no new features could ever be added because it was impossible. <laughs> Uh, and so they rewrote it all, but instead of rewriting it all and then just saying like, cool, now we've got a good clean code base. Hey, now we can add more features over time. No, 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 no. Let's make a new version entirely and let's actually change the default behavior so it doesn't match the previous version's default behavior. And that's something called plug and play. And I don't really know what that is, because I've never heard about it, but apparently it's been in Yarn 1 for about 18 months already. Oh, cool. But I've never heard about it, ever. But it, it, it does something different. It doesn't use a known modules directory. Presumably it just uses, like, the global cache. I don't really know. Right. Oh, I figured it out. Yarn Plug and Play, also abbreviated PNP, is where instead of generating a node modules directory and leaving the resolution of modules to node, we now generate a single .pnp.js file, and Yarn will tell us where to find our modules, speeding up the process. Mm -hmm. Thrown shade at NPM. Yeah, I or guess. Node. Nice. Uh, huh. So I've never seen this doc before on the Yarn website. I've never, I didn't know this feature existed. But in the blog post, everybody says like oh yeah people have been using it but the market saturation has been very low well it's been very low because nobody knows about it right um okay so then what happens well so then they are talking about well what are we going to do with this new release of yarn 2 so we're going to move yarn 1 over to a new repo the legacy repo and it's going to be deprecated don't use it anymore and then the old website's going to go away to yarn legacy.yarnpkg.com and the new website's going to take over the main place. Uh, all the Node Docker images are going to get rewritten um, in Node 14, so uh, mid-2020. And those will use Yarn 2 and a bunch of stuff. And uh, all of it's super cool. Like, there's a new Yarn DLX command. It's like NPX, but Yarn-flavored. Ooh, nice. Um, there's a new uh, patch method. And so basically with the patch, you can say, hey, cool, um, if you want to monkey patch a particular package in your tree, just make it, put your alias name here, put your patch file and directory here, and it will just clobber the old one for you. It's perfect. A lot of cool stuff. A lot of cool stuff that you can do if you need to do it. But uh, it doesn't have default working functionality with existing code in all cases, plug and play makes assumptions that will break other code. If you use Webpack and you use something like uh, the the resolver or alias functionality, you can basically make aliases. So you might do like at sign libs slash whatever, and libs might be in some random folder, but with the alias you can just type out at sign libs blah 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 blah, and it'll import it like it should well apparently that'll break with plug and play so uh then everybody started freaking out and um effectively this is a angular one and angular two situation where the whole thing is completely shattered and fragmented right. And somebody uh, pitched, hey, what if we just change the name of Yarn 2 to something else, and then we can just use both, or one or the other? And uh, that sounded like a good idea, but then the original t development team said, no, not not so much about that. Um, yeah, this has just been a weird, weird thing. So, effectively, Yarn 1 is going to stay around. It's going to be the entry point for Yarn 2. Yarn 2 will be opt-in only. Yarn 2.1 will um, implement a PNP loose mode, which will warn you about any issues that would cause PNP to not work if you did choose to use it. And, uh, I don't know, the whole thing is a disaster. Interesting. Mm. And I know I remember seeing something that Facebook uses Yarn a bunch because they were one of the... I think they, they originally created Yarn, but I don't think they're really doing much for it anymore. Like, the main developer has left Facebook and is, you know, working on their own. 
but um they're like yeah we don't need to use yarn too it works fine for us now so there's like a, a fragmentation of who wants to use it who doesn't and it definitely seems yeah like an angular js angular 2 situation where if they're using the same namespace it's going to get really difficult to find any help or anything really yep uh like the beauty of yarn at the time was that npm was really 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 bad still is pretty bad but if we're going to shatter the parity the like the external consumer parity between the two npm and yarn then whatever we go to must be really really good so i i've never used plug and play because prior to all of this happening i never heard about it uh yeah it's just all very strange and then if you didn't think that was bad enough then they're changing other things too. So, for example, in Yarn two, whenever you have an, a a package .json script, that uh, script might have like rmrf. Well, you can't have that's not portable across operating systems, right? Windows. Uh, yep. Yarn two implements a basic shell for you, so now you can R- rmrf whatever you want anywhere, anytime. Huh. Neat, I guess. Neat-ish. Well, if, neat-ish, because that means it's no longer... If you do that, it's no longer portable between NPM and Yarn. Right. And that's... It's not terrible, but it's weird, because that was never... It, that never felt like a thing we had to worry about with the regular version of Yarn. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So the way this was handled is very strange, and, you know, all of our favorite friends... Um, Chris from Facebook, uh, Dan from Facebook, and Mark from, I don't know what he actually does. Uh, and, you know, just tons of people from the community came out to figure out what is really going on here. And it's just very strange. Mm. Uh, and, and finally, the, the best part about all of this is none of this works with React Native. The thing that it was all invented for. Oh, that's the big thing. Yeah, yeah. So I'm hoping in, like... A month or two, somebody will figure out, like, oh, yeah, that was actually a really bad idea. Hey, let's not do that anymore. What if we just didn't? So that is our uh, yearly scheduled rant about yarn. Please enjoy. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I'm still going to use Yarn 1 because uh, most of my projects already use Yarn. Yeah. Um, it's just It's just kind of interesting how we can't really ever have nice things. We used to be, like, the big thing used to be, oh, NPM is kind of taking a bad path by, you know, becoming a for-profit entity that's trying to sell private instances of their registry, yada, yada, yada. Um, and it was only a matter of time before Yarn did something that people would also, you know, it's, it's, it's a totally different kind of transgression, for lack of a better phrase, but yet here we are. And I guess, uh, I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll see what NPM 7 and 8 bring. I know they have some roadmaps there. Like, I know, I think pure dependencies are going to be installed again by default. Oh, what oh. a disaster zone. And NPM 1 or 2 did that, and then 3 removed it or something like that. I don't know. It's been a long time. Yeah. <sighs> not not that I could ever use pure dependencies with any consistency or to any effective use in the first place but whatever it's good to know that now i can rely on it even less <laughs> um yeah well you know in other news you have some updates brandon yeah so uh a long time listeners of podkit might recall that i have a uh, linux laptop uh that i got uh, a long long time ago about three years ago uh and uh, dual booted Windows and Linux on it. It's all well and good. Um, but uh, I, it's looking like I'm going to be doing some more uh, stuff that I can't do on a Mac, which is kind of a bummer. Um, so, for example, a lot of packaging of Windows executables and stuff like that. Uh, and this little buddy is getting a little long in the tooth. So what I ended up doing was uh, putting that one up for sale uh, and uh, picking up a uh, XPS 13 from the Dell outlet, a refurb uh last year's edition of the xps 13 fancy uh, yeah which should be pretty neat given that uh you know they just released a new one so this one isn't really all that old um but it's going to be kind of nice because it comes with the windows license which my last one didn't uh and and i got kind of a steal of, of a deal on it 
and accidentally got a touchscreen version, which is new and novel. I haven't had a touchscreen computer ever before, other than perhaps an iPad. But, you know, an iPad's a little different. Do they even make ones without a touchscreen? They do. Uh, and I was hoping for one of those, frankly, because I don't want a touchscreen because a touchscreen is kind of a gimmick in my mind. But yeah. um, nonetheless, here I am. Uh, and it's it's actually quite nice. Um, so I'm, I'm installing Red Hat Enterprise Linux on it. And the reason for that is because um, I kind of wanted to see what it would be like to use a real um, supported Linux operating system as opposed to trying to cobble together uh, stuff from Fedora or Ubuntu in order to make it work. Um, because Red Hat does some really good, good and interesting work, and I always thought it would be kind of interesting to, to see what it would be like to use straight up Red Hat. Uh, and that's actually been kind of a terrible time. I can't seem to register for a free license to save my life. Uh, I have a support ticket in about figuring it out, but given that I'm not paying them, I have to imagine I'm not a terribly high priority. Um, and uh, this morning, before we started recording podcast, podcast, podkit, hi, that's the name of the show. Um, yeah. Meow. Uh, I uh, tried reinstalling it to see if uh, you know un unregistering the thing and re-registering it uh, would would do anything. And in the process, I managed to totally break my Windows install. Um, so that's probably what this afternoon is going to be uh, for my for my part. But I have to say the build quality on this thing is pretty absurd. And, um, you know, I can already tell a pretty significant difference using Red Hat versus using um, an open source Linux distro on the quality of this. Like the the very first thing that I did when I, when I had Red Hat installed the first time was I was able to get it to, um, it actually installed a device specific firmware bundle that Red Hat was like, oh, you have an XPS 13 7390? Uh, here you go. Here's your firmware package. Uh, go ahead and install this, and, and you're good to go. Which is like, man, that's super neat. Like it, it didn't have to do any, you know, it wasn't even like an automate, uh, an automatic like, uh, oh, you know, you need these Intel Wi-Fi drivers, this mm -hmm. upgraded non-free. It was like, nope. Here's a package that will ensure that you're getting, you know, Red Hat certified support for this machine. And it's like, dang, that's uh, that's nice. pretty neat. So. Okay. With any with any luck, that'll be really great once I figure it out. But I have to find out how to get my Windows install back up and running. I need to wait for uh, Red Hat support to get back to me in terms of uh, what the heck I'm doing wrong. But once that's good, it should be good to go. It'll it's really nice to uh, take this thing. I'm I'm pretty excited to take this thing and. Uh, I I have a Flutter and React Native environment set up on the Windows side. I just about had it set up on the Red Hat side before I went and destroyed every all, all of my work. Um, but uh, it should be good stuff. I'm pretty pretty happy with it. Um, and you know, I'm kind of on a three year cycle with computers. So my MacBook's about two years old now. My uh, my Linux laptop was about three. So uh, you know, who who knows what MacBooks will look like in another year and a half uh, when I look at upgrading a MacBook. But um, it's it's kind of good to every once in a while to use a Linux computer that like actually feels super snappy because mm -hmm. I'm used to using only extremely low or underpowered or um, or perhaps worse than underpowered, just like just just kind of intentionally limited Linux machines, and this is like the first Linux laptop in, in quite some time that hasn't felt intentionally limited. Uh, it's got six cores, nice big battery, um, 4K display, all that good stuff. So should be pretty neat coming to a uh, meetup and or festival near you. Very so, nice. There we go. So is the 13 actually 13 inches, or is it like pretend 13? That's a good question. Um, my iPad display is actually slightly larger, um, so it has to be fake 13. It's probably like, I don't know, maybe I should find a tape measure and measure it, but uh, it's it's <laughs> it's around 13. It, it looks a little bit like you took a Kindle and flipped it on its side, right? Hmm. The display looks very Kindle-like for some reason. I don't know if that's helpful. It's probably not. Like a matte display? Uh, no, it is glossy. I uh, I mean like a Kindle HD. Uh, actually, you know what? I have a tape measure right here. I'll take two seconds and grab a tape measure. See what it looks like. This is real podcasting <laughs> when tape measures are involved. Well, I mean, that one time our our good friend Marco took some calipers to a MacBook Pro or something. So, I mean, what's the difference? That's true. Yeah, that that is even more next level. You know what? I do not have a tape measure. So, Aww. we'll just say, let's see how many iPhones it is. All right, so it's one, <laughs> two, and a half. So it's two and a half iPhones across. Doesn't, uh, if, doesn't the iPhone have a built-in tape measure? 
Oh well, yeah, yeah, but the AR kit be, stuff. It'd be AR though, and it would quite work. I don't know. Let's try it. Let's try it. Tape. I think measure. it's me- measure. Measure. There you go. We got it. Okay. So let's scan my environment. Okay, we got it. Move iPhone left to right. Okay, so we got one. Yeah. Yeah. Look at that. It's eleven and a half. Ooh. That seems fair. I'm gonna grab a screenshot of this because that's that's pretty funny looking. <laughs> That'll that'll be good to go in the uh, what should I call it? Uh, show notes. That's what the kids call it. Show notes. Eleven and a half inches across, which means it's it's got to be thirteen inches diagonal. Which hey, maybe I can do that. I think you uh, can. I don't it's know. It's just point to point, right? Which one of us is an AR developer? Not I. Up, <laughs> up. Uh, uh. Yeah. So there you go. It looks like it's fourteen inches across. But only eleven and a half inches uh, uh, in length. So I don't know what that means. I guess if you average those, it's like twelve point something or other. So yeah, yeah. Call it's it a pretty... thirteen. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you just you just kind of mush it together. Um, no, but it's it's a really neat, tidy laptop. Looking at it, it looks almost like a Chromebook mm-hmm. um, in terms of how compact it is. But it doesn't feel like Chromebooks. Sometimes feel like they're like you know a third of a laptop, like yep. not a real thing but this definitely feels like a real real deal actual computer which is kind of nice it's been a while since i've used a real computer like that i've been thinking about getting something kind of like that just just so that i don't have to pull out my work machine and i could just have some non-work stuff just open whenever i'm around just to go to it that would be nice yeah someday yeah i think the mistake i always make with that stuff though is like well in this case, every computer I have is a work computer now, except for my desktop, which I never use because why would I use it when all my work stuff is on one of my other two work computers? Uh-oh. No, I but, have the same uh, problem. Everything I do is also work-based. So, yes, I agree. Yeah. But, you know, it all works out one way or another. Huh, works out. Works out. So, yeah, there you go. It's the Red Hat story. Uh, feel free to, you know, you'll see lots of more Red Hat tweets, I'm sure. Uh, on 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 the Twitters when I when I as I try to figure out what the heck's going on with this. So, yep. Nice. Well, I think it's time for the next favorite segment: new Twitter followees. Woohoo! Uh, Brandon, your name is first on our list. Do you want to start it off? All right. Oh man, this should be fun. So my first Twitter followee is a uh, infosec consulting firm called Bishop Fox, which has been in the news for some reason. I don't really know what. Uh, but the reason why I wanted to shout them out as a new Twitter followee is because they have a really cool cybersecurity dictionary, um, which when you hear it that way, it sounds kind of fake, but um, it's actually really quite nice. And I used this when I worked uh, in, uh, PR because, uh, it turns out a lot of people don't really know, um, what the correct, uh, usage of a lot of these words are, um, because turns out a lot of them are kind of like, uh, neologisms, uh, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, so they, they're kind of coinages or things that have come out of, uh, either the corporate world or, you know, who knows, who cares, right? It's, it's words that people don't really know the usage of because there isn't a common usage in the same way that like, um, a lot of these things aren't listed in the AP style book, for example. And it's really nice to be able to have something that's just like, no, you know, this is how you're not going to look like a, like a dummy. If, uh, if you want to use, for example, the phrase Wi-Fi or phishing or hacking or something, you know, stuff like that or yeah. Kubernetes, right? Like, uh, all of those cybersecurity terms are listed on their thing. And, you know, it's kind of cool that they have a, um, but they have, uh, a lot of resources like that. So there you go. Good stuff. Love a good, uh, Bishop Fox. Uh, and then the rest of these have nothing to do with tech, but they are people I followed. So the first one is the comedian and actress, Kristen Bell, who's, uh, known for being on the good place. Uh, which is a really good show that you should check out because it's really funny and uh, just finished. So, you know. Yeah, I finished it last week. Very, very good show. Highly recommend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, my last new Twitter follower is a food writer by the name of Allison Roman, twitter.com slash Allison E. Roman. She does a lot of cool recipes uh, and, and is kind of the uh, the most public lead of uh, the New York Times cooking uh, section. Um, and, uh, folks who have been longtime listeners of PodKit and know me from the internet, 
uh, might know that I like to cook a lot. So there you go. Um, not a lot of tech this time, but that's kind of how I like it. So there you go. Nice. Looks, looks how about delicious. you, Brian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I followed a few people. Uh, first is uh, Issa uh, Silvery, uh Silvera. Yeah. I am struggling. Let's just say Issa. Uh, she's a Mozilla tech speaker. I saw some tweets of interviewing at um, a conference. Uh, I think her and another guy interviewed some people. So I'm like, cool. Follow. I want to see cool people. So Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Looks like based out of Sweden. Yeah, I think it was Nordic JS. I think it was around that time. Oh yeah. Um, let's see. Next is uh Natalie Marlini, um an application engineer at the Lego group. So I don't know. I saw Lego and I'm like, ooh, tech That's and cool. Lego together. I wanna follow. Yeah, I saw uh a couple tweets of hers shared like, around. Presumably recently. that's like real Legos, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yes. Okay. The, it's, it's, it's not like an agency called Lego. It is no. literally the company that makes Legos. Okay. Legos. Legos official t- company name is Lego Group. It's really so. interesting. Like, what, what, what are, what is Lego doing with serverless deployments? That's. I mean, they have a website. They have shopping. You know, shop online. They have some games. Um, uh, I don't know. Clearly, I, just, I have never looked. All the Mindstorms have to talk to something. I okay. I know. I just bought last week the Lego ISS, a brand new Lego kit, and um, it should. I think it. FedEx tried to deliver it to my work yesterday, and they because <laughs> it's a business. Uh, so Uh-oh. I will likely be building that this week. The Lego ISS, very, very, very cool kit. Um, I can. Uh, I'll try to find it in the in the um, the internet internets and link it in the show notes. Cool. Nice. Because I know all of you want Lego ISS. All, all sorts of uh, there are all sorts of good Lego kits that are that seem to be targeted at like, um, you know, a- adults basically, right? And it's it's always really interesting how that how it works because you know we all we all have that. I think that's one of the core things that Lego gets right as a company is it's like man, yeah, people people of all ages want to feel that excitement of building a thing. And when yep. it can be something iconic, like this, like the space station or a Ferrari or something like that, like, like people, people really get into that. Um, and it's, it's cool. You know, they're kind of like, uh, I don't know. They're, like Nintendo is kind of like that too. And uh, I would say even like companies like Ikea kind of have that same sort of mentality. It's kind of, it's kind of nice and kind of refreshing. Yeah. Because it's it's you have fun and you get this attachment when you build something and then it's a great uh, piece to just have around your your home. Um, yeah, I have I have acquired many Lego sets in the last year and a quarter or so. Yeah. So yeah, I uh, I have many at work and I am running out of space. Uh, okay, finally I followed Pablo Rochat, who seems to be. Um, a kind of uh, how did I describe it to Ryan in the fringe? Like a gorilla um, graphic designer around emoji pop culture, yep, comedy. Um, Brandon seemed to know who who they were from Instagram and the ad space, but I found I found them on Twitter, and it's very good. You should check it out. Some very amusing short videos and things like AirPod stickers to leave on the ground, and people think they find AirPods, but they're just a sticker. Yeah, or um, morphing emojis to do different emotions and things like that. Or or our um, ironic uses of MacBook Pro power bricks. Yes, lots of marshmallows and cookies and pizzas being cooked. Yeah. Um, so as, as Brian mentioned, I I know of this person because they're pretty popular among uh, ad agency types. So it's it's kind of interesting. There there are a couple ways that you can get really. Oh man, it's that guy. It's the motorcycle dude. Ugh, I know, right? Ugh, my window. It's only open an inch, and you can hear everything. Yeah, I get you. There's no way to win. Kind of like me and my uh, coil wine. Everywhere I go, there's coil wine. Um, the, uh, but Pablo is kind of a a, a big player among ad agency types because. Um, it's it's interesting just kind of the the amount of fame he's been able to generate with mostly like with four or five bits right 
Um, and you know, you, you look at Instagram accounts of like certain creative directors and stuff like that, and they'll all do similar stuff. So it's not, it's not like this is something that this person invented, but it's, it's something that like, man, when you find a bit that really resonates with people, all of a sudden, you know, you're kind of the touch point for that sort of comedy, right. Or that sort of, um, playful design. Right. And so, you know, you have a lot of meetings like what, you know, what can we do if it's like this, that has that same sort of element of like, oh, wow, it's, you know, you, you know, you think it's going to be one thing and it's, it's another thing like, oh yeah, everybody knows that MacBook power bricks, uh, heat up when you use them. But like, you know, what if we took that to the logical extreme and like cooked a little Play-Doh egg on, on a power, on a power brick. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's fun stuff. All right. What about you, Ryan? Well, I actually did something unusual, and I actually did follow some people. Oh, man, that's weird. So first we have here uh, James Stainer, maybe? Stanier? Yeah. Um, He's a uh, VP of some type of company, and I think he followed me at first, and then I followed him back. And the reason I followed him is really because uh, this book he wrote, Becoming an Effective Software Engineering Manager, that's an important topic to me, so I uh, yeah. thought I should keep track of that. The book's release is sort of weird. It's coming from the Pragmatic Programmer people, or at least their publishing group, but the way the book is being released is it's being released chapter by chapter while it's in development to the uh. kind of like in group like i think if you just buy like the the ebook version you'll get chapters by chapters and then eventually when it's actually done done you can buy the physical version uh i'm i'm not uh not not super uh unbusy right now so i have not read the 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 beta ebook but maybe one day yeah uh let's see who's next um so Lucas Eder is a person who is in the Java space, and I have done some Java work lately. And specifically, he is the writer, maintainer, and uh, really cool promoter of Juke, which is a alternative to Spring Data and other ORMs. So this this lets you write type safe, object oriented SQL. Uh, and it will basically do reflection on your database and get you all of the types, column names, and all the things. Pretty cool. And then finally, I have here Mark Heckler, I think. And he is a person from Spring. And I like Spring, so that's why I followed him. Nice. Good stuff. It's awesome that you have follow followees. That's cool. Yeah, yeah and it's uh, different followees. Like I followed all the JavaScript people. Now it's time for some Java people. Yeah, it's you know it's the same language, so it makes sense. Yeah, I mean you know they're related like car and carpet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No. Well, um, so what are you guys doing um, for the next little while? I believe our next scheduled episode is uh, about a month from now. So what are you doing for the next month? Uh, I'm uh, getting back in the swing of things at work. Um, I'll be working on some table work again. So, you know, React and tables and things. Um, something, something, maybe uh, Microsoft Office UI Fabric Aha. React framework. Maybe React Table version 7 too. I don't really know yet. That's what that I'm React working on table, here. That React table library is intense, so oof. Yeah, so we'll see how that goes. Um, otherwise, I'm going to go sk- probably on my once a year downhill skiing adventures. Go to Trollhog in for night skiing, 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. It'll be great. Oh and wow! They just have lights, or like, how do you do it? Yeah, they they, they light the runs, but it's it's cheaper. It's it is colder, but so I don't know. I've I've never done true night skiing like that i've i've of course skied till like nine or ten but mostly in high school with (laughs) at afton alps with ski team or something but um this will go into the wee hours and as an adult you can like hop inside and have a warm um slightly alcoholic beverage and then go back out to the ski runs and things so that might be kind of fun i don't know so we'll see how that goes watch out for trolls at troll hogging they're (laughs) everywhere yes very trolly hecklin left and right gotta watch out for it Oh yeah, sounds like fun. Yeah. How about you, Brandon? 
Uh, gosh, I don't know. I uh, just moved offices, which is neat. I think I mentioned that earlier. I really like this new office. So I'm probably going to be spending a lot of time here because uh, it's where it's kind of in the middle of everything. And I can bike bike here now, which is good without it being like a whole a whole deal. Um, probably going to just like slowly move in over the course of the next couple of weeks. Uh, got some fake plants up, all that good stuff. Uh, next JavaScript amend should be cool. We're going to have Holy Land and we're going to have a special presenter, uh, who's a office neighbor of ours at, at the old place we used to be officing in the old we work and, uh, I don't know, drinking coffee, spilling coffee, um, stuff like that. Lots, lots more work. I've been, um, you know, not my highest billable hours ever clearly, but I took kind of a, a chiller quarter four of 20, 2019. So it was very, uh, relatively light. Um, and I've been, you know, meeting all of my, uh, billability targets, um, so far in January and, and first week of February was like kind of wild. It was the busiest meetup week I've had in quite some time, uh, serverless MN, JavaScript MN, and then, uh, the Google developer group on, on Monday, Tuesday, what are days? I don't know. Uh, so I'm excited to have a little bit more of a calm meetup week. Um, but, uh, you know, other than that, it's going to be kind of nice to be back, heads down, working on stuff, getting some good stuff done. Because uh, I don't know, it's felt like kind of a uh, a weird and wonky last couple months. So it's good to kind of shake out the cobwebs and get back to it. Great, a new year, new you. Yeah, new year, same me. That's for sure. Uh, I've, okay, <laughs> but that's okay. It's you know, it's good good sentiment. But nah, how about you, Ryan? Yeah, uh, not too not too different. I'm gonna be doing some work. Um, I'm on every project at at work, and uh, that's a lot of fun for me. So I will be helping everybody do all those things. Nice. And uh, yeah, you know, like it's um, it's gonna be spring one of these days, maybe. I hope. Well, whenever you're working with spring, it's always spring. <laughs> hey, and uh, you know, it's it's always good when you can boot up spring and uh, you know. 10 to 20 seconds and get yeah. stuff going so huh. Huh. hopefully that all all works out we, d- we did have a spring like day a couple days ago so that was that was maybe our first uh our first attempt at at uh at spring right and then the docker container crashed for about i don't know another two months yeah that's, yeah. that's how it goes it does darn groundhog groundhogs in the kubernetes cluster Gosh, you say groundhog man. groundhogs Oh, God, I love those ground hugs. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's some like really high level uh, chaos engineering there. Right. <laughs> nice. Well, uh, where can we find you all, Brandon? You can find me just about anywhere, but mostly on Twitter, where I'm Brandon underscore MN, or uh, in the various coffee shops of downtown Minneapolis, which is uh, where, where I live most of my life nowadays. How about you, Brian? Uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L or my website, brianm.me, which has links to every other place you can find me. Um, otherwise, yeah, I'll probably be at Misfit Coffee a lot this next month. Uh, Ayo. You know, on, on weekends, I got a nice Misfit co- uh, gift card for Christmas from my parents. So I will be there. I had a delicious drink yesterday. I forget what it was. It was an Alpine something. It was an iced drink. It had oh, like yeah. a splash of some liqueur in it for flavoring, and it was it was quite tasty. Um, I believe that was the Alpine LTS. <laughs> you know that Good that one. would be a great name for a drink there. <laughs> I got, I gotta say, Misfit is probably one of my favorite shops in town. I don't get there nearly as much as I uh, as I used to or ought to, but uh, the dude who runs it, Marcus, is a. Um, uh, a really good guy, and uh, I used to, I used to go there all the time when they had the coffee truck over by my old old office about five offices ago, uh, over in Gold Medal Park. So uh, it's uh, really awesome to see that they have a uh, brick and mortar shop now. And uh, you know, I will I will gladly meet up with you to work on some stuff uh, on the weekend at some point, Brian, because uh, love a good misfit visit. Totally. Otherwise, Bob's Java Hut, my other like a little bit closer to home, <laughs> so even more favorite coffee shop. Yeah, where where else would you rather watch uh, Spring Boot than at Bob's Java Hut? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, it's good. For sure. There we go. What about you, Ryan? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially at RandomWire on Twitter and, of course, on my website, ryanramperset.com. It's always good to find me at those places. Definitely. Well, uh, if you uh, like this episode uh, and want to talk about it, uh, hit up our 
um, show notes, well, to, to find the links at thenexus.tv slash pk55, um, and then you can talk about it on uh, our Reddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash thenexustv, uh, or our Twitter, which is also at thenexustv. Um, otherwise, we have a Patreon at patreon.com slash thenexustv if you like what we're doing. All right, well, uh, that was a good one, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Have a good one. Watch out for cars. Have a good one. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from from the the Technological technological convergence. Convergence.